Welcome to the Writer Magazine Insider Podcast. I'm Greg Drevenstead, Editor-in-Chief at Writer Magazine. Our guest today is Ken Akaya. Ken is the founder and lead instructor at Superbike Coach, a motorcycle training company based near Sacramento, California. Ken hails from Germany, and in the 1980s and 90s, he raced in the German Track Trophy, German IDM, Dutch Open, and European Championship. After retiring from racing, he was a test rider for a Ducati team in Germany and worked as a track instructor. Ken and his family moved to the United States in 2008, and he started the Superbike Coach School in 2009. Superbike Coach teaches a wide range of classes on cornering, body positioning, getting your knee down, riding with a passenger, supermoto, how to race, and even how to wheelie. We talked to Ken about his racing background, his teaching philosophy, why his on-track training classes make students better street riders, and which of his classes are most popular. Here on the podcast and in Rider Magazine, we're big advocates for training that gives motorcyclists the tools to be safer, more confident riders. The more you know, the better it gets. Ken, welcome to the show. Hey, welcome back. How you been? I'm doing good. It's great to have you on the show. Thanks so, so much. You run the Superbike Coach Motorcycle Training School, is that right? Yeah, that's correct. That's a street rider and track rider school. Very cool stuff we have there. And so you're based in the Sacramento, California area, is that correct? Yes, we are. But uh, I go pretty much everywhere where my clients want me to be. Okay. <laughs> so that could be pretty much everywhere. Yeah. So you started this school in 2009, is that correct? That's correct. I came into the U.S. 2008. Uh, actually, exactly on Obama election day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, so we got the green card, my wife and I, and then we came over to the U.S., figured that how... Uh, so back in Europe, I was I was teaching track riders already after my racing, uh, professional racing career. And then coming here, uh, I figured how bad the education is for street riders. Getting the driver's license is almost like it's a joke. Sure. Yes. And uh, so I decided then to you know, offer street rider training, which goes beyond parking lots. So I'm doing this since 2009. And since about 2011, we're booking up every class, every class. I'm running now like 50 to 60 classes the weekends and then lots of one-on-ones in between. So <laughs> we're, we're busy. So like I said, you've been booked a lot since the last 10 years or so. So but what I want to curious about is you immigrated to the United States in uh, 2008, but you had a racing career, track instruction career in Europe. So kind of let's go back to the beginning, you know, back in the 80s and 90s, you yeah. raced in various uh, series, German track trophy, German IDM, Dutch Open and European Championship. Tell us about that. Very, very competitive stuff, because back then in the 80s, 90s, it was it was common that MotoGP racers attended the national championships. So they set the bar and that's where the competition was. And uh, back in the time, especially Germany, there was a it was a hell of a competition. I mean, uh, and then also going into European championship, MotoGP wild card and all of that. Yeah. So then I uh, finished my career in 95, and not 95, actually with a victory somewhere in Poland. I forget the name of the track. <laughs> I set the lap record there, and uh, I actually uh, uh, felt relieved when I retired. I mean, there's a point for a professional athlete uh, where it's just over, and you need to know that. And, right. and I felt it was the right time. So I walked away from the sport, relieved. Actually, it's, yeah. I know it sounds negative towards the sport I love so much and gave me so much and still does, but there was no pressure anymore. I mean, uh, yeah. you don't go to pressure with, in the bed and stay and walk, wake up with pressure. So, yeah. So then a uh, long time after racing, I was uh, looking what to do. It was like six, seven years later or something. And uh, when my daughter was one, do you have kids? No. Yeah. There, there's a quiet time in the house when the baby comes home, you know, so <laughs> the house is quiet. <laughs> yeah. So I was looking what to do. And then I stumbled over my old press map and that was a whole lot of mess from the last year. I didn't take care of it. And the, I thought like, okay, let's clean it up. And uh, first picture came in my hands, showed me, it was a bird shot. My mechanic pushes me out on a racetrack in Belgium, Zolder circuit. I, ever heard about that? Yes. And, uh, 
that lap I did when he pushed me out there, I put a lap record on this track, which I was holding for for many years. So all those memories came back, you know, <laughs> and then uh, but like I got to write something to it and I couldn't stop writing. I was, it was floating out of my head into my hand. I was writing about that one lap. Right. And so, yeah, that's a long story there, but it tur that turned to an entire book. It's called 25 Seconds, <laughs> which is the attention span people give you when you tell them about your passion. <laughs> Oh, those glassy eyes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I'm, I'm not selling books. It's a, it's a German language only thing, and it's sure. long ago, and I'm done with that. And uh, but with this book, I came back on on race race. I got offers to race again. I still had believers uh, and, and fans in Europe, uh, but I rejected too much pizza and wine. You know. Meanwhile, <laughs> yeah, but uh, I started teaching then. Uh, I started teaching and uh, I, I designed a program for a top notch racing school and it literally dropped me off into my by then unknown next passion and that is teaching. I'm very, very passionate about it. Very, very straightforward with people. I believe that's the, the big difference with superbike coaches towards other schools. So yeah, and then uh, back then I was in Europe, I was teaching track riders and racers, mo mostly on the mental side, which right. is my strength. And uh, yeah, and then Again, as I come, came to the U.S., uh, it was uh, it was a realization that how easy it is to make the driver's license here, right? Which is a whole other different story in Europe, especially Germany. So, yeah. Well, there's much more of a tiered licensing process, and the training is much more involved to get your license as you progress as a motorcycle rider in okay. Germany and some of the other countries in Europe. That's correct. Uh, yeah, you, you have no idea, actually. You, you start with 14, you're riding a, a moped, like 15 miles fast. Like you can run 50 miles. If you're riding, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, but that means driver's license, and that means uh, required school time, sitting time, hours, many hours, riding time in front of an instructor with a, in a car with a radio to you, and, uh, and a final exam, and lots of money, really expensive. So two years on a moped, and then you're 16, then you're riding an 80cc, that's another driver's license. Then you're 18, you can ride now any motorcycle, which is reduced to 35 horse. So, uh, yeah, and then you're 21, then you can ride open powered bikes. So, that's a whole other career to do there to yeah. finally ride open powered bikes. And yeah, some call it social state, but back then, well, when you're 18, you don't understand it. I saw it in mine, right? I uh, was not happy with that. But looking back now, you can tell by the rider quality. You know, it right. doesn't cut short on stupidity. People still buying 240 horsepower motorcycles right after having a driver's license and then getting hurt. But yeah, you can tell by the statistics as well. So. Well, I know in this country, I mean, you know, most states you're, you are required to have a motorcycle endorsement, but there's not necessarily any required training. Like you, if you were able to go and, and complete your motorcycle endorsement test, your riding test and your written test, that's it. There's no, you know, demonstration that you've had any formal training no. whatsoever. So when, when I came here, I had to renew my driver's license, which was okay. It's a different side of the planet, right? New rules, new laws, but uh, I did the, uh, I can't go to school. So I was happy that the DMV allows me to uh, go to them, just make my written exam since I was beyond 21, and then do the circle test, the keyhole test at the DMV. Right. So I was flying through this like with flying flags, but, uh, <laughs> and for 30 bucks, I had my driver's license. Look, you can, with a little luck, you can make it through, right? Right. So I was I was questioning this a lot, and then I decided then to to train street riders. And my first class it was uh, the road skill, uh, which I which I still offer, but as a one on one, one on twos kind of thing. And that was literally booked up in in one week. And then uh, within while I was doing that uh, this first program I offered, I figured that I don't have the same tools as a teacher, which I had using a race. So then I designed the cornering school program, which is a three day program, and that uh, we we using little race tracks like go kart tracks, supermoto tracks. Because uh, I believe what you need to learn is to corner. Motorcycles are designed to corner, and obstacle avoidance is cornering. You don't learn that on a parking lot, Greg. Right. Right. You know, and then just because someone does this and then someone comes with a big fat ass Harley, makes an S turn through some cones, that's not advanced training. I have people on day three making stoppies on the apexes out of a full knee ankle. That is advanced training. 
And uh, we're pushing them hard, we're pushing a lot, but uh, what's coming out of that is very, very obvious, and you can tell. Right. Well, I mean, it's, you know, the statistics would back it up that, you know, uh, those people that have motorcycle accidents, uh, many of them do not have a license, do not have training. You know, sometimes, of course, alcohol is involved, which is a completely different factor. But, you know, people that are just haven't had much experience beyond just basically f- figuring out how to get their license and can kind of sort of get out into traffic and so forth. But, you know, if they they some people just don't want to spend the time or the extra money to get more training. But I think what a lot of people not only are they not be able to ride safely, but a lot of people don't think enjoy riding as much as they could if they could ride with a higher level of skill and capability. That's actually a great point. What what we get most from the people who uh, finish this uh, three day program is actually that they found a new mission for their riding. It's not like driving by Highway One and enjoying the ocean. It's it becomes more than that. It's uh, right. it's uh, it's not even about the motorcycle any much more. You know. Yeah. In, and then uh, fear stating, like getting hurt, breaking things. And uh, so you bec- this becomes way more enjoyable in general, you know? So people have a mission, having goals. Re- look, uh, when I was teaching races, and I know that from myself, races are easier to teach because they come to me with a, with a, and, and can define what they need, right. what they're lacking with. Street riders come to, I need more confidence. So what the hell does that mean? <laughs> Yeah, and they, they, in most of the time they can't even define that. Right. So right. that will change everything, and that's what we are most striving for. You know, that that we give them uh, goals, missions, understanding how physics work, how they self work. You know, what what triggers my fears, what what makes me not enjoying this at its fullest. Right. And that's I enjoy that very much myself. Well, you know, from, from what I understand, some of the things that uh, many street riders are get fearful of is is some very fairly basic maneuvers like doing a u-turn let's say you've got to do a u-turn at an intersection or you've got to do a tight maneuver in a parking lot and especially if you've got a big heavy motorcycle maybe you've got a passenger that if you don't have a good understanding of when to use the front versus the rear brake when to maybe feather the clutch a little bit uh, when to apply some throttle that all of a sudden it's it's becomes it's too mysterious when it's actually you know again they're, they're skills that can be learned and that they can be mastered uh, like you said, you do a three-day course and people go from maybe a very modest level of skill to a fairly high level of skill in just a few days. Yes, uh, but please understand what my, my philosophy is that different. I, I, I strongly believe the moment you shift through the years, the moment where you know where everything is, the brakes, the clutch, and whatsoever, parking lot time is over. Right. What, what you need from there, I, I know that, I know that, that uh, you know, it's many, many disagree with me on this, but what I get to see with my people there, that's a different story. So, um, and you only understand it once you've been through that. Right. So what you need there from, from there, once you have a driver's license, is miles. Right. Lots and lots of miles. Just rolling straight forward. And even if it's after rush hour on the freeway, making 60, 65 miles an hour, just to get used to a higher, higher pace. The longer you roll, the less are you struggling with the slow maneuver stuff. Right. Because you, you just create a feel for how the motorcycle handles. So struggling around, just trying to establish a hundred, a goddamn 180 on the parking lot, of course that's hard. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Your choice and all of that, you know. But right. rolling, making miles and miles and miles, you don't need a school for that shit. Right? Yeah, yeah. I don't need I don't I don't need a school for three hundred fifty dollars showing me on the parking lot how to how to park a motorcycle up or downhill. Come on, right, right. Mm-hmm. So I'm curious. So you uh, focus mostly on on street riding skills. I know you have some racer academy. You have some track things, or and you do some one on one stuff. But for your street riding skills, so your students are typically riding their own motorcycle. Is that correct? Yes, but we also have rentals for people with longer travels. Come see us. Okay. That goes especially in our wheelie course. You know about the wheelie course, actually, right? Yeah, you know, I've been interested. I've been interested in that one in a long time. I'm actually want to ask you about that in a minute. Yeah, and you're more. You are more than welcome to come and check it out. <laughs> so, so people are riding their own bike. So, in any given class, if you've got multiple students, you may have somebody with a cruiser, somebody with a sport bike, or how do, how does that work? 
That's a great point there, Greg, because uh, that's that's what I really love the most on it. You know, it's like, here's that sport bike rider, right? <laughs> and here's that 55-year-old cruiser rider. They seem not to get along with each other. Don't I don't understand why not. We're all brothers and sisters. In the end, right? <laughs> but there seem to be a difference. Yeah, I don't have other English word for that. Pretty little now. Yeah. Um, but in this class... They find each other. No shit. It's like uh, they begin to understand each other. They they learn from each other. How how is that be? How is this going to be to ride a like seven hundred pounds motorcycle through time turns like I do on my right. Ninja four hundred, right? Right. And in the end, we, we, or Goldwing, and we have when, once we're done with the with, with the uh, counter steering on the on the second day day two, dude. Then I. Uh, those Ninja 400s don't go away from them with the gold wings. That's really interesting to see. Yeah. And uh, yeah, they, they they get together there. It's, uh, I really enjoy it. I had once uh, the plan because I, I, I know there's always, uh, we get lots of requests in our cruiser classes and what specific classes of cruisers. And we offered that also uh, once. It was like two or three years ago. But I gave up on it because I don't like it. I really don't like it. I like when they when they come together. I, I like when they learn from each other. Right. And it's supposed to be this way. Because right. in the end, in the end, we'll fight the same problem. That's gravity. <laughs> you know, no matter, yeah. You know, same physics. Right. You, you got two wheels, you have the same problem. Yeah, and then this one can go faster, this one can only go slower. That's the only difference. Right. Right. So uh, you've also done some training for the US Air Force, is that correct? Yeah, yeah, at least hours, or I, I'm still am official trainer for the U.S. Air Force. Uh, that means I'm on the list uh, for official trainers at the Department of Defense. The problem is, and that goes actually deep, is that I don't know who that who the training offered, MSF or Total Control. I'm not sure. I'm I really not. I'm really not sure. Uh, so they offer parking lot training for them, and... Uh, the Beale uh, Air Force Base here in California, they uh, they know it's not working. The, their pilots, their highly trained uh, Air Force members getting still hurt in their spare time. And uh, so the crucial part was that the commander asked me in the end if I'm certain means like the MSF or other uh, parking lot schools. And I go, no, sir, because if I would be, I would have to do the same shit they do. You'd have to do what? I would have to do the same bullshit they do on a parking lot. Oh, I see. I, I see. To, <laughs> I would right. have to stay to the same curriculum they running. Right. Right. That's not. That's not what I'm doing. Right. Right. Yeah, you I understand. Know. Yeah, if you're if you're gonna do according to you know an MSF class something, you've, they've got a pretty strict curriculum they've got to stick to. But if you've got your own training program, yeah. uh, you can train according to your own you know uh, classes so, and, and philosophy. So I'm still I'm still listed as an official uh, Air Force coach, but still Air Force members come see me. Right. This is still happening, but it's not on their parking lots. I'm right. not going there and using a parking lot because that's right. against my philosophy right there. So uh, again, you're talking about training people for street skills and mm -hmm. for basically to be safer riders. I know, again, I know you teach some racers and some on track skills. So people, but I, I know that most of your students aren't aspiring to be racers. I mean, you know, maybe they go do some track days sometimes, but most of your students are going to be street riders. So that's what you're trying to convey in your, in your training is how to be a more competent, confident street rider. And you made teach that in a track environment, mainly just so you can sort of control. There's not cross traffic. There's not things like that. So, so, but you've, you've got this wheelie course that I've always been curious about. And for me, I'm not looking to do wheelies on the street, but I, I do dual sport riding and do some trail riding and the being able to lock the front wheel of a dual sport bike to get over a, a ditch or a log or something like that's pretty important. So how do you teach a wheel? How do you teach people that don't know how to wheelie? How do you teach them how to wheelie? That's what we have an entire class, Greg. It's your pop most popular class, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's the cornering school. Oh, the cornering school. Okay, yeah. That's cornering school, but uh, yeah, I mean for the for the wheelie course, yeah, we have people coming from all over the world actually. So uh, yeah, it is popular. 
that is very popular. We have it three times a year and we've seen people all, from all over the world. And the most fascinating thing is that we, we don't get to see hooligans. It's the you and me guy yeah. who wants to do something, you know, coming out of the box, going over fears and something. And, and yeah, it's uh, looking for a challenge. Sure. So from the 4K tall office worker to the 60 year old guy, old Greg. <laughs> comes yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, no shit. It's uh, it's really, really fun. So that, that's a that's a whole other uh, roller coaster ride. This week, of course, we have uh, people running through four stations. So they're using the long straight uh, with their own bike or the rental bikes uh, within 20 minutes. And with the within these 20 minutes, uh, the other groups are busy with our wheeling machine, which which I constructed, and with the mini bike. So and while the other group takes a break, so and you, and you need that break, trust me. Yeah. Uh, so it's a whole other circulation uh, for five, probably five sessions. So that's all. That's so what is your what does your wheelie machine consist of? There are wheelie machines you can buy. Yeah. Though they working with super heavy drums, right? It's like a like a roller, like a dyno. Uh, yeah. Right. And to make a wheelie, you need resistance, right? Right. So. Yeah, since the th drum is like 400, 600 kilograms, I'm still, I'm still a little bit tricky. That makes that easier. You have you have more resistance there. Uh, but once the bike is in the air and those th that big weight is spinning, it just keeps spinning. Right. So it's weight. So up in the air, that wheelie bike, uh, that wheelie machine bike will just do wing and doesn't come back. So there's... There's no way that you can learn how to operate the throttle in the air. I see. Yeah. So an hour wheelie machine works the other way. I won't tell you how. <laughs> <laughs> but but I mean, no, it's it's a... <laughs> I won't tell you how. Okay, but you have. I mean, you have a motorcycle with a uh, with a wheelie bar attached or something that you, you yeah. can go through. So again, you talked about several different stations, and so it sounds yeah. like I may have to find out for myself. But I was just curious because I imagine you've got to sort of get people to learn whatever the basic skills are with you know clutch and throttle, but then also just the being able to be okay with like once the bike is raised up, and that's where their fear kicks in is that's how they that's deal that's with that, that's so they can part and dangerous part, right? Yeah. Uh, so our 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 rental bikes they come with the wheelie bars, uh, which is not a guarantee not to fall. Right? I mean, you can really overdo it, uh, and you, when you rush so fast up, and you still can roll over, right? So, yeah. But it's a huge confidence booster, and in, in many many let's say ninety percent of the cases, it's a saver. Yeah. But not a hundred percent guarantee. So. Uh, yeah, and we're using uh, our bikes are supermotors, real supermotors. You just need to look at them. They ask you how high you want to go. You know, <laughs> <laughs> so you're not you're not half the day busy getting the damn thing off the ground. You right. can start working on airtime way right. soon, and we see the success there. Sure, sure, it's uh, more money. Sure, a rental bike is expensive, but uh, they're going down a lot, and we're fixing a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So. It's it's well worth it to go with the rental bike, and in the end, when you when you say, well, now how trend, do I transfer now my experience here to my bike? That's kind of easy because the tipping point, the balance point in the air, is kind of the same feel on right. everybody. It's just that how to get it off the ground. That's the difficult part on heavier bikes. You want to bring like what 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 are you up to bring? I have a KTM 690 Enduro as a personal bike. So it's basically, it's, you know, there, there is a supermoto version of that bike. So I just basically have the one with the dual sport wheels on it. So. It's got the torque. It's got the power. Exactly. Yeah. It, it'll, the front wheel comes up pretty fast. Yeah. There you go. So yeah. you go to the rental in this case. But like I said, in my case is, I'm a, a, and it's typically dual sport riding where I, there's times where I want, and this is the main reason I've wanted to learn the skill is to be able to be riding on some trails and be able to loft the front wheel over something so I don't have to, so I can kind of ride over it more smoothly rather than just have the hit the front end and then the whole bike bucks and so forth, where you can just sort of pull the front wheel up to get over a little ditch or a log or some or a rock or, or a ledge or something like that. That's what I'm looking to be able to do more confidently. This is why many, many uh, dirt bike riders joining that class or racers, uh, yeah. racers, because they got to be able to, you know, maintain, maintain a wheelie without losing time, losing fears of, of, uh, of the front wheel not touching the ground and all that because that is a loss of time and uh, so yeah we have races dirt street 
all the time. Sure. What, what I really enjoy is is the people there. You know, it's, uh, they're coming, of course, with lots of expectations. Yeah. But it, to start it out, it's the it's the basic course to start it out. You know, you can't expect that you look like uh, Valentino Rossi making his victory, uh, really passing by the pit lane. Right, right. So you've got students. I mean, again, this is the sort of thing, especially if things are people are on street bikes, is that, you know, you really don't want to be trying to learn certain things on the street, doing it in a more controlled environment. So, like I said, and and having somebody not because some people may not know what they're almost everybody's going to have some bad habits and have somebody to sort of point out here, you need to not do that, do this. That really makes a big difference because trying to trial and error. It's one thing if you're a little kid on a mini bike in a, in a dirt you know, lot somewhere, you know, that learning that way is one way, but as, as an adult, as a, you know, street rider or something like that, you really need to do it in a con controlled environment. Absolutely. And uh, we also want to get people away from just learning this from some rock star on YouTube, you know, yeah. sure it's for free, but what does it do? Right. Uh, yeah. There's nobody correcting you staying safe. Right. Then especially in a safe environment. Right. right. Yes. So you said uh, your cornering school is or uh, cornering class is the one that's most popular. Is that the one that's over three days? Yeah. 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 So uh, obviously you'll progress. So what would you do on the first day, then the second day and the third day, just in general, you know, how would people progress over those few days? First, first of all, I got to tell you that uh, there's a lot of misunderstanding what day one means. Uh, so most people understand this must be level one or something or right. this. This is for, you know, beginner riders. Day two is for intermediate or what's no, this day one is day one of three days. Yeah. How can you be more obvious with that? Right. I mean, <laughs> if you go vacation to Hawaii, it starts with goddamn day one. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, yeah, you learn and on day one. It's all about finding the lines, apexes, et cetera. I know that sounds minor, but come see them riding. Oh no, it's not. Right. It's really bad. The the way people setting up apexes just produces more G forces, more lean angle. Ergo, they are more danger than they believe. Right. You know. So here is that typical uh, street rider school who teaches people to do late apexes all the time, which is quite some BS. Because uh, you make more lean angle, you make more G forces if you try to establish more speed. Right. Look, it, the thing is, as a beginner rider. I can send you through a turn on any line. You make it through. Right. Now we're adding pace to this. Every time you ride, you become naturally faster. This is happening with or without us. Right. And then it turns to a problem. On the track, you can't keep up with the big boys anymore because you're still doing those stupid late apexes and stuff. You know? Yeah. So it kind of goes that way. And then, uh, especially going into viewing technique. Yeah. People uh, are trained to yeah look as far as you can, which is even bigger BS and leads to even more late apex and being triangles, etc. You know, we, we we get to see like people coming out of turn 12 on, on little 99 race, which we're mostly using, uh, looking ac across the grass towards the two or three turns up ahead. And then I stopped them and asked them what they do, and they confirmed it. Yeah, they're looking across the grass to the next turn. And I go, yeah, this is the reason why you can't figure out this one. You don't know where the bike is heading. You right. don't have any sizer, you know, where, where is the bike exactly heading? On what line am I? Am I close enough to the apex, et cetera? So there's a whole lot of cleanup to do, and we do that. So, and then uh, we're going into emergency braking, which I believe is uh, mostly really missing. Sure. Uh, yeah, really. I mean, to know what the brake and you are capable of, emergency situation is crucial, right? I mean, that's your endurance. And uh, people are lacking with this, really. So we bring brand new riders, most experienced riders, down to the ABS, making stoppies within, within an hour, you know, yeah. while other schools teaching them to park. That's how I'll call this, parking, within 30 feet. Right. That's a truck length, like, right? Right. So, yeah, they're doing stoppies and all of a sudden the evil fades and they're having a big smile on the face. Yeah, that's pretty much day one. Day two is all about counter steering, doing this right all the way through because uh, I saw it's never been fully taught what counter steering is all the way through. 
So people counter steering to turn, turn, turn. The, the bike feels bouncy and rough actually on mid turn, et cetera. And then uh, there's something I call Uber steering because Akaya steering sounds bad. I won't tell you what that is. <laughs> Oh yeah, but it's another uh, huge survival skill. So yeah, that's that. And then uh, there's also in day two is an extension of the viewing technique, which goes more into the mental side of viewing technique. And then day three is all about trail braking and also a Uber braking, which I don't also don't tell you what that is. <laughs> <laughs> but it's another it's another survival skill setting on top of the of the trail braking. So very interesting stuff you probably never heard of. Well, hey, it sounds like I need to sign up for your cornering school. Like I said, I've always been curious about the wheelie school, but the cornering school is probably where I should get started because even though I've been, you know, I've gone through a number of track schools and training, it's been a few years. Uh, I always need to polish my skills. I put a lot of miles on bikes and, you know, a lot of different kinds of bikes, but yeah, I, I would love to sign up for one of your courses at some point soon. I would love to have you there. Awesome. It's on 821, day one, 821. Okay. Yeah, I'll take a, I'll take it. Up, but if you if you say you're coming out, then I have a spot for you. Okay. Yeah, thank you. I will uh, take a look at my schedule. So, uh you've got a full schedule of the uh, we've talked about a number of the different kinds of classes and training you've got. You've got a full schedule on your website, is that correct? Oh yeah. But uh you will feel when you just look at the booking status, you see we are booked till September. Okay. October. Okay. Yeah. Well, for anybody that's well, listening and uh, if you're this is, this is something uh, most people even don't understand. It's like, th this is all, and I'm, and I'm not lying here. I, I could, but I'm not, okay? Right. <laughs> all word of mouth. Yeah. Yeah. We are, uh, the, the last advertising, uh, my advertising I did was with Google for 120 bucks, like eight years ago. <laughs> right, right. I gave it a shot. <laughs> right. But this is all word of mouth. I think that tells a lot about a Superbike coach. Sure. You know, we can't make, uh, I, I can't make a movie everyone likes to see. I can't yeah. make, I can't write a book everyone likes to read. Right, right. We call this natural selection. Right. But, uh, hey. Well, right. those that are interested, your your website is superbike-coach.com. Is that correct? There's a hyphen there. Don't forget that. We'll definitely have a link in the show notes. But for anybody uh, who's interested in taking one of Cam's courses, go to his website, uh, check it out. You can also sign up. You send out a, a pretty regular newsletter that has some announcements and, and some things like that. So you can go there. You can put your name on the mailing list. And uh, it sounds like if you want to sign up for one of Cam's classes, you need to plan ahead. You can see where there's some open availability and uh, take a look at it. Ken, I really appreciate your time. It was I enjoyed talking to you. I appreciate you having me. <laughs> it's great. Thanks. So again, I will I'll follow up with you soon about trying to get into your uh, corning school. And, uh, and like I said, we'll have links to your website in the show notes. Awesome. Thank you great. so much. See For the Writer Magazine Insider Podcast, I'm Greg Drevenstead. Thanks for listening and keep the rubber side down. If you've enjoyed listening to the Writer Magazine Insider Podcast, please subscribe. Leave us a positive rating and tell your friends. We also encourage you to visit writermagazine.com where you can get the latest in motorcycle news and reviews and sign up for our free weekly newsletter. You can also subscribe to print and digital editions of Writer Magazine, which is published 12 times a year. Thanks again for listening.